Hello, my name is Trevor Brockman. I am 35 years old, um, and I was an alcoholic addict for probably 15 years. Um, I am now recovering, and uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm, I come from, you know, AA and A's philosophy, so it's a little bit of how was your story then, how is it now, and uh, what did you go through kind of in between. So that's kind of how I'll be laying this out for you guys. Um, so yeah, when I was growing up, I remember everything being um, kind of acceptable as far as drinking and, uh, and drugs as well, but most, mostly alcohol drinking. Uh, I remember uh, I grew up with my mother, um, and I was a single child at that point. Uh, my parents had divorced, and uh, when I was about two years old, they divorced, so it was before I remember. Um, but I remember at a very early age not liking alcohol. I remember uh, not too much about it, just that when my mom would drink, it was very different. Um, how she would act, uh, how she would talk to me, how she would respond to things, just different. And I, I didn't like that. I knew that that was, you know, uh, different, you know, and I just wasn't used to that. I didn't enjoy it. Um, you know, and it wasn't until later where, where things got a lot worse as I was growing up with that. Um, you know, some physical abuse, some emotional abuse. Um, it was pretty bad. It, w it wasn't good at all. And I remember, and it's just so crazy because I do remember thinking, like, I don't ever want to be like this. You know, I, I don't want this in my life, you know, especially for my own children one day or whatever. I don't want to be around this and I don't want to experience this. Um, my father, on the other hand, he, he, I mean, he also drank and stuff, but I only saw him on the weekends. So I do remember growing up, uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he just didn't drink around me, not until later. So I, uh, I, I didn't experience the same kind of uh, just attachment and, and, and anger towards that alcohol as I did with my mother. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of fast forward a little bit. I remember first time I tried any alcohol uh, or drugs, uh, the alcohol was at my mother's house um, and I was with a couple friends and I remember, you know, just stealing a few beers and but I remember instantly feeling uh, gratification, uh, just feeling better, a little more comfortable in my skin, um, which, you know, at the time I, I hadn't identified what that was or what implications that would have. I just knew that I felt better. Um, and I immediately wanted to do it again. Um, and, uh, you know, the repercussions for me didn't come f till a lot later. Um, but, uh, but I do remember, um, even when I was younger, I remember I must have been about 14, maybe even 13 years old, and uh, my mother uh, bought me alcohol. She, uh, I remember a friend and, and I were uh, just kind of joking around, like, I wonder if she would, you know, buy us alcohol. And, you know, uh, yeah, I, I w we went up to her one day, and I guess her philosophy was more, um, if you're going to do it, do it with me or, or at the house so that you know, you're not out driving and this and that. And, and, and at 13, 14, I don't think you know any better. I mean, and it also, at that point, it sounded great. It sounded awesome and fun and cool. And, uh, and you know, now as a father today, I, I look at that and go, oh my God, I would never, you know. But, but at the time, it was like, wow, you know, this is really cool. And so, you know, she was the cool parent, you know. And so, so that went on for a long time. She would buy us alcohol. She would buy me cigarettes. Um, it was just accepted. And, uh, so I remember feeling that too, that getting that reinforcement that it's all right, you know. Um, not to mention, as I said, my dad did drink as well. Not a lot around me until later, but, uh, but just I think seeing that all the time, seeing you know, people that are really influential in your life deal with problems and you know, whatever is stress in their life with alcohol and or drugs, I, I think kind of reinforced that behavior to me that it's okay, it's okay to do it. Um, it's normal, um, which today I know is not very normal. So, so yeah, fast forward a little bit. Um, things got real bad between my mother and I, um, fighting physical fights, you know, just craziness, uh, cops being called, just really bad things. Um, so eventually when I was about 15, 16, I remember wanting to leave, uh, and my, and move in with my father. At this time he had remarried, so he had, um, married uh, someone who uh, had two children. 
already. So I wound up having two stepbrothers, and then um, they wound up also having uh, a son together who uh, is also my so he'd be my half brother. But I just call them all my brothers. But you know, I grew up with them. But um, but yeah, so moving in with him at first was was pretty pretty okay. I mean, he lived in a better part of town. Um, you know, not better schools necessarily, but it just seemed it was a bigger house. There was more people. I was used to being an only child, so I was really excited about having my brothers around and all that stuff. And uh, and I do remember going over there. I didn't drink. Um, I had kind of stopped doing a lot of that, um, and I was kind of against it. I remember seeing my friends and stuff like that um, getting into it, and I I didn't like it. I I was pretty adamant and against it. Um, but I do remember uh, specifically one of my brothers had gone to California and he came back and everything had changed. He had tried smoking, he had tried smoking pot and and uh, it, it just kind of wore on me. I know it sounds silly, maybe it's peer pressure, I don't know. I just remember thinking it just switched at some point from really not liking the idea of it to what the heck, I'll just try it. And um, my other older brother, I remember the first time I smoked a join he you know he told me this is straight from our parents room and I and again that's to explain that it was just reinforced as okay behavior well if it's straight from your parents room I guess it's okay you know so I do remember that and I remember um, things quickly getting out of hand after that especially when I was drinking and pot um, and, it, and it wasn't very long until other things happened but I do remember you know grades dropping in school uh, things getting really bad um, pretty fast, um, not really caring about a whole lot besides that. And, and there were some attempts for recovery. When my father caught me smoking pot and stuff like that, he uh, he tried to put me in an in outpatient rehab. And uh, I'll tell you, if, if you're not ready to, to do it, it's not going to work. I mean, my my goals going in there were just to get out. That's it, just to get out of there as fast as possible and how can I use again. And also, uh, putting yourself in a situation where there's just a bunch of other people that were using, uh, I remember finding out that I could take LSD and I could take mushrooms and I could take these things that weren't drug tested, that you can't test for in, in typical drug tests. So it actually kind of wor worked and like I said, it depends on your attitude towards it. I, I just remember my my feelings being just so against it and and so I wound up coming out of that rehab with more drug issues I was actually before it was just kind of alcohol and pot now it was LSD and ecstasy and all these other things that um, don't show up on drug tests or if they do they're out in a couple days so whereas pot stays for for a long time and uh, so yeah so that really didn't work out very well for me at all um, and, and things quickly went downhill like I said the grades were slipping things like that um, but uh, but yeah, and things at home were, were bad too. Um, I remember my brother and my father getting into a fist fight and, and him breaking his nose. I mean, this was just typical stuff going on in my house when I was growing up. Um, so yeah, um, kind of go forward a little bit. Um, so I'm dabbling in drugs here and there, you know, whatever, but, but it's bad enough to where I don't graduate high school. I mean, it gets to the point where I'm so far behind that it just makes more sense to get my GED, to drop out, get my GED. And, and I didn't know any of this. My father had explained to me, like, you know, if you if you were to go ahead and drop out now instead of do an extra two, three years of high school, you could actually get your GED and if you want, might go to a junior college and, and, and if, you know, and he explained to me that college was so much different and this and that. I had no, no teachers at that time were explaining any of that to me. There was just explaining to me that I was a loser and I would never amount to much because I had failed high school. I will fail everything in life. Um, so yeah, so for that, I remember specifically um, being excited to not go to school anymore. I hated it. I didn't like going. I mean, at that time, I mean, pretty much, I, I was doing almost every drug there was except for heroin and cocaine. That was not where I was at at that point. Um, so I do remember, uh, you know, just continuously things getting worse. But at that point, when I dropped out, 
um, you know, I, I did take some time off from some of the drugs and alcohol. And this just goes to show that you can seem like you're in recovery or, or you can seem like things are getting better, but if you don't treat the underlying issues, the emotional issues, the trauma and stuff like that, or if you have trauma happen later in your life, um, it can come right back. Um, so anyway, I did wind up getting my GED and I did wind up going to UC and I, I went to uh, originally, you know, the community college room Walters and then I transferred over and, and during that time again, kind of experimenting with drugs here and there, but nothing too serious. And I, I was able to graduate, you know, I have a bachelor's degree and all that stuff. But uh, at the same time, I mean, you know, I always think back and look at myself and go, you know, I wonder what would have happened if you know, I hadn't been using at that time how much better things could have been or how much farther I might have gone. Um, but I do remember, so kind of uh, rewind just a little bit before graduating college and all that stuff. Um, in, in 2000, uh, let me see here, 2001, or no, not 2001, I'm sorry, uh, 2007 it would have been, or no, I'm sorry, 2004. I'm so bad at dates and it's hard to remember kind of timeline. Um, yeah, 2004. Uh, so my father had increasingly, he, he was an alcoholic, but he continued to use other drugs. Um, and he continued to, uh, you know, lose job opportunities and he was abusive towards his wife. And I don't know about physically, but definitely emotionally. Um, he was abusive to my brother. Um, and, and see, I didn't see a lot of this at the time because I had moved back over to my mother's house. So a lot of what was going on, I was just kind of hearing through them later on and stuff. But uh, yeah, it was bad from what from what I've heard and what my brothers explained to me. Um, so eventually it got really bad to the point where my stepmother and my uh, brother left and my father was alone, you know, with his alcoholism, his untreated alcoholism and uh, drug addiction. And uh, I do remember um, feeling a little like concerned, like I wonder what that's going to be like, you know. And uh, I'll never forget, I got a call one day from my brother just saying, you know, uh, our father tried to take his life and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, what? Like, what's going on here? It was very out of the blue. And I remember thinking, wow, that just doesn't sound like him. That's so weird. And so he had taken like a whole bottle of Xanax and uh, my brother found him. And uh, luckily he did when he did because it was... Uh, apparently like pretty close to where he, he could have died. Um, so that was, I'm sure, super traumatic for him. Um, and I remember being really worried. And, and at the time, I don't think any of us knew what to do. Um, we wound up doing the whole Baker Act thing. And if, if no one's familiar with that, it's basically like a 72 hour mental health hold where you make sure someone's evaluated for their mental health based on their actions and things like that. Um, so yeah, we did that and we thought he was a little better and we thought things were going okay. And, and I had even moved in with him because I thought if I'm around, maybe things will help. You know, just having someone else around the house and not being alone, especially with all the drinking and, and drugs that he was on and stuff, I thought it would be better to be there for him. And then, like I said, uh, yeah, so right around 2004, um, yeah, I woke up one morning and uh, he was always an early riser. So I remember thinking, yeah, that's weird. It's like 9, 30, 10 o'clock, like really strange, right? So I just went ahead and did my business, uh, made my breakfast and, and took a shower and stuff. And uh, then I remember, you know, um, going into his room and finding him and, and he had he had overdosed. He died. So um, obviously that was super traumatic for me. Um, and I remember not being able to deal with it uh, and not knowing how to deal with it. Um, you know, and, and I had suggestions from family members as far as uh, going and getting counseling or this or that, but, but I didn't really take it seriously. At the time, I, I was only drinking and, and occasionally using, using drugs, and uh, it wasn't something that, that I thought, I just thought I could get through it. And I, at the time, I had some good friends and stuff, so like most of the trauma and experiences of emotional, physical abuse, all that stuff. I just buried it. I didn't deal with it. And if I could, you know, recommend anything to anyone, it's, you know, get help and, and take suggestions. If people tell you that that's something serious and you need to get help or you need to see someone, just try it. What's the worst that could happen? Um, 
So that's where, where things in my life really took a turn for the worse. After everything with my dad passing away and all that, um, you know, uh, and, and, and by the way, let me preface this with when I say overdosed, he, he took his own life. He did it on purpose. So, I mean, yes, he overdosed on drugs, but, it, but I, he did it on purpose. So, um, anyhow, so I remember not dealing with that, being really stressed out and just dealing with it by drinking and using drugs. Um, at the time, painkillers were getting really large and huge and and yeah, I mean, I had a hole in my heart, I had a hole in my soul, I just was empty. I was an empty shell of a person and I hadn't dealt with anything from my childhood or obviously with my father and all that stuff. So yeah, I just started using painkillers, you know, almost, and if anyone knows anything about this, it's not something where you're trying to, uh, you know, I, I use them legally. I, I, I was prescribed them for uh, some knee pain that I had. I was a skateboarder growing up and uh, I had some really bad knee pain and they couldn't operate and this was like a temporary fix and at the time it wasn't a big deal. Um, it was something where, you know, they identified you had this kind of pain and here you go and use them as needed and, and I did. I, I didn't abuse them or anything, at least I didn't think I did. Um, but it quickly got out of control. They were giving me stronger medication, it got worse and worse and, uh, you know, and my whole theory on this is it's, it's pretty simple. The, everyone got hooked on the painkillers because they were everywhere. But then, you know, Purdue Pharma decided to kind of cut off the Oxycontin and uh, make them um, the OPs, which if anybody knows, I don't know, this is drug lingo, so I don't expect a lot of people to, but basically the new pills that they put out were unbreakable. You couldn't snort them, you couldn't crush them, you couldn't, you know, so uh, they thought this would help the drug addiction. But what it did is it made things increasingly worse because now you've got all these people hooked on opiates and for anyone that doesn't know withdrawal from opiates is absolute hell you you won't die nine times out of ten but you'll feel like it and you'll feel like it for a long time um, so anyway yeah the uh, the opiates uh, the whole craze with the heroin and everything I mean it's pretty obvious I mean people weren't able to uh, get those pills anymore so heroin is cheaper you're talking a dollar a milligram for Oxycontin or Percocet or whatever your opiate is versus $10 a bag for some heroin. So um, so yeah, things got increasingly worse. Um, I was just about finishing up school and stuff, but at the same time I was on all these painkillers and then when that stuff happened and the pills became unusable and stuff, I mean, it just made financial sense at the time. And, and at that time I had been on them for so long that I needed them, I physically needed them. I couldn't wake up in the morning. If I didn't have them, I would I would uh, have, you know, I'd be throwing up, I would be sweating profusely, uh, I'm hot one minute, I'm cold the next. I mean, people kind of compare it to the flu, but I'm kind of like, it's like the flu times a million. With the flu, you can sleep. Uh, with heroin addiction, you can't sleep, you'll never sleep, you won't eat, so uh, you just feel out of your mind, you feel crazy. And uh, you know the only thing that's gonna make you feel better is more. So I think people distort that too. It's not so much that people are trying to get high, it's that they want to feel better. They don't want to feel that withdrawal. So yeah, so a little bit about my dealing with that. I mean, I started out snorting heroin. I mean, it was something that I was doing again financially just to stay healthy. I mean, and when I say that, stay healthy, like not be sick from heroin use, from opiate use. Um, so I continued to do that. I mean, and it was only a matter of time. I had a friend friend, I use that term loosely, at the time that was living with me and, uh, you know, he, he had been shooting up. I mean, he had been using the needles. So, and I, again, it's one of those things, like think back to when I was saying when I was younger, I'll never drink, I don't want to do this. And then all it takes is a couple things to happen and your whole worldview has changed. I remember seeing him do that and thinking, I'll never touch that, I'll never do the needle. And all it took was, a, you know, Again, it's it's like a financial decision. It's it lasts longer if you do it that way. It's it's just more, you know, better really to do it that way. So eventually, I was shooting up. I mean, it was, and it wasn't. I I don't remember it being that much of a change. I just remember thinking one day, like, why not? Because it was always around me, and the people I was around were doing that. You know, that saying, "Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are." I mean, if you're around friends and people that are using like that, it's gonna happen. Um, eventually you're gonna kinda 
whatever your morals or ethics are, they're going to kind of probably go out the window. So yeah, that was really where drugs and alcohol led me. I mean, I was using on a daily basis. I was stealing, you know, things to support my habit. I had, uh, you know, anything to get my drugs. And I remember it, it's such a slow process. Like people, I want to really stress this. People usually say, well, how, how can someone be a heroin addict? Like who wakes up and shoots heroin? That's not how it works. No one wakes up and shoots heroin. If you were to do that, I'm pretty sure you would just overdose. I mean, maybe someone out there has done it at some point, but it's really rare. It's a, it's a progressive disease. It happens, you know, slowly but surely, like I said, through the pills and then through whatever else. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a progression. So, so yeah, I remember, um, especially when it got to the heroin, things, consequences came fast. I was arrested twice, um, you know, paraphernalia, minor, like, uh, uh, what do they call them, PI, uh, public intoxication, um, just being high, uh, basically, in public or while I was driving and, and things like that. So, you know, at the, and at the time, I want to stress this too, the stigma of addiction drives me crazy. I hate it. It upsets me because I remember that feeling of, I want help, I want out. I don't want to live this way anymore. I know I'm better than this, I know what I'm capable of. But, you know, I was also really petrified of what my family would think about me, what my friends would say, how people would view me, um, what that looked like. And I even had some friends in my family, or um, yeah, some people in my family that had been addicts and had come forward and they were shunned. I mean, they were treated differently. They were talked about behind their back. This, this all has to end. This is ridiculous and it's crazy and it's killing people. I mean, when people can't get help because they're scared of how you feel or what you think about them, it's just, it disgusts me. It makes me so angry. I, I guarantee you I would have gotten uh, sober years ago. Um, if it weren't for those feelings of guilt and shame and, and worried about what everyone thought about me. And maybe mm, a lot of that was in my head, but I do know, I, I hear it today, I see it online, I, I see the let them die and all these just horrible comments from everyone that has a PhD, mind you, in these, <laughs> in these uh, categories. It's always those people, but, uh, but yeah, it's ridiculous. It's people that have no experience with it, they've never gone through it themselves and probably don't have a loved one that's gone through it. So it's really easy for them to make very, you know, asinine comments that generalize a whole huge group of individuals. So, uh, so like I said, I, I, things kept getting worse and worse and worse with the uh, heroin use to where my whole life I would wake up and I had to get money and I had to use. From the minute I peeled my eyes open in the morning, it was, where am I going to get it? How am I going to get it? And how much am I going to get to last me through the day? Um, that was my life. And, and no one wants to live like that. Like I, let me stress again, no one wants to live like that. You do that for a couple weeks, do it for a couple days. You want out. Try a couple years. I mean, it's just absolutely miserable. Everything you go through is just, that's it. That's your whole life. You have no friends. You have no family. You have no, um, you just don't have a life. I couldn't keep a job. I couldn't continue like studying or going to school or anything else I wanted to do. Uh, friends and family, and rightfully so, were, were backing away. My, my younger brother Garrett, I mean, he, uh, he had gotten sober a long time before me. He had his own struggles with alcohol and addiction. He owns a treatment center out in LA now. I mean, he has done marvelous and great. I even felt weird coming to him. That's how bad, and again, maybe this is more in my head, but that's how crazy it is when you're in that situation how you feel about what people are going to say and do because um, people would say well hell he's in there why would, doesn't he just help you you know and it's like I'm sure he would have it's just that there's a whole stigma that goes with that and it's just yeah so so anyway um, things continued and continued to get worse and you know I don't know what point it was where I had just had enough I don't know exactly what it was but I, I knew I needed help and I remember the first thing that I, that I tried to do was methadone, which, and I'm not here to bash any, anybody's certain way of doing it or whatever. I think if you're not on heroin, you're not on heroin, and that means you're not dead. 
So, you know, whatever way gets you to where you need to be, I'm not here to judge. I'm just saying from my personal experience, methadone did not work for me. Um, I continued to use. Uh, when I was being drug tested there, it wasn't seen as a bad thing necessarily that I had tested positive for uh, other drugs, including benzos, which can kill you. Um, I, I now know that I've studied this stuff a little more. I mean, you mix benzodiazepines, which are your Xanax, your Valium, things like that, with any kind of opiate like that, it can kill you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there was no repercussions. I just remember, you know, so, so my addiction and my underlying trauma and that counseling aspect, none of it was dealt with. The suicide from my father and the abuse and stuff growing up, none of that was dealt with. So, you know, and I think now that I know a bit more about that and I've studied addiction and trauma and stuff, there's a huge correlation with trauma and untreated trauma and your ability to fall into some of these addictions. So, so yeah, I do remember thinking, you know, I need help and what am I going to do? And I did eventually reach out and, uh, you know, I, I, I did speak with my brother and, uh, and I spoke with my uncle who, uh, you know, he had been really close to me after my father died um, and he kind of stepped in a lot and, and helped me with a lot of things and he had introduced me to AA. He had introduced me to going to meetings and, you know, getting out of my shell and, and getting that support group and I, I think that's super important. Um, and I got counseling, you know, I, I went to a therapist and I, you know, dealt with my issues. I dealt with my father's suicide and I dealt with the abuse, physical, mental growing up, you know, and, and after I dealt with that stuff and not just that, but learning how to deal with, uh, developing coping skills, you know, for when things do happen, when someone leaves me, uh, in this world, when someone dies or if someone uh, breaks up with me or I lose a job, not to go straight to that bottle or that drink or that needle, but to actually deal with the issue at hand. Um, and these are only skills, these aren't things taught, I don't believe, in school, at least not for me. Um, so, or, or unless you have a good family that I guess tends to, and not that I came from a bad family, but I just don't remember people sitting me down and going, these are coping skills for when you have death in your life or when you have you know, physical and emotional abuse or trauma. I mean, these are just things that you can't get unless you go to uh, licensed professionals. And, uh, and again, the, there are people out there, let me stress this too, that are here to help you. They want to help you. They have spent their whole life studying to help you. So, uh, so reach out to people. I think you'll be really surprised to, uh, to find these people and how dedicated they are to helping you. So yeah, so fast forward, I'm going to AA meetings. Um, I'm now, um, you know, and like I said, I had tried the methadone and all that didn't work. Um, and I was still using, so I was still an addict. I mean, I was still an alcoholic. I was still using, so it, it hadn't helped that. And it wasn't, like I said, um, I always tell people, I think the best approach to this is really a myriad of options, right? So you've got your, your counseling aspect. It's, it's what's determ determined in uh, the addiction field. It, you know, it's biopsychosocial, right? So you got your biology, your sociology, and your psychology. So the sociology part of it would be your AA. And then you got the biology part of it, which is going to be, you know, there are hereditary aspects to it, but you can change that based on your actions. Um, and then the psychology, which is also, you know, a lot of people find this hard is once you get off all those drugs, you've got to deal with those issues. I, I had, I've been diagnosed with major depressive disorder. I have anxiety issues. And these are things that I was burying down because I was always on drugs. I didn't even know I had these issues. So, um, so that's another aspect of it is the psychopharmacological part of it, where you want to take uh, medications for the certain things that are, uh, that you need medication for. So, so yeah, so the combination of the AA and support groups, um, being around people that don't use, um, and, and then, you know, taking medications that I need and, uh, just being, um, trying to be a better person and understand that when I need help, I need to reach out. I need to talk to someone. Um, I need to let someone know. That's the biggest thing is let someone know, you know, having a sponsor and having people I can call like tons of people on hand. Um, you know, um, maybe I can do a little shameless plug here, but I mean, I, I currently work for hotel California by the sea, Cincinnati. Um, they are located in blue ash. I've been there almost a year now. 
as a treatment technician and um, I'm studying to have my uh, counseling license. And as I said before, I have my bachelor's in psychology, so I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm moving forward and I, I think my goal, honestly, my goal is to just not have someone feel like I felt, not go through that feeling of despair for so long, so unnecessarily wrong, for years and years, the trauma and the abuse and all this junk, and it's like, I just, the resources are out there, they're all out there, and uh, it's just not advertised and it's not broadcast to everyone, but you can and will find them, in, and in this day of age of information, you can find anything, and you'd just be surprised at how many people are out there willing to help free of charge. Um, so yeah, so today what my life looks like. I am a father. Uh, my son Maddox is 16 months old. Um, I love him to death. I think he's also changed my life dramatically. Um, you know, uh, like I said, growing up uh, with my mother drinking and using and all that stuff and, and drinking with me and, and buying me alcohol. Being 13, 14, that's super cool. Uh, being 35 right now and having a son, I can't imagine drinking and using drugs with him. It's disgusting. It disgusts me and it makes me feel sick to my stomach, to be honest with you. Um, I just can't imagine it. I love him to death and I want what's best for him. And, and, and honestly, I want him to have a better life. I don't want to bring him down to, you know, if I was still in addiction, I wouldn't want him to be with there with, you know, with me in that. I would want him to be better. So I just, I still to this day, you know, and, and unfortunately, my mother hasn't gotten help. She's still an, an alcoholic. She's an addict. Well, she's not an addict, but whatever you want to call it, she's an alcoholic. And uh, my grandfather passed away about a month ago. Just to give you an example of, of her, I don't see her very much. I, I, I keep my distance, you know. I, I live a very happy life for the most part nowadays. I'm in a I work at a treatment center. I help people for a living. Um, like I said, I'm working on my counseling license. I... Every day I'm trying to, and I surround myself with people that are not using. I mean, my girlfriend right now is, uh, you know, the mother of my child, Maddox. I mean, she, she doesn't drink, she doesn't use, and it's amazing. I, I, I just love the fact that Aaron doesn't use any drugs at all. Um, and that's one of the first relationships I think I've been in that, that it's just not present at all. And it's been such a godsend for me. Um, so, yeah, uh, I just think that... Uh, with my mother, you know, so with my grandfather's funeral and everything, she showed up smelling of like vodka or booze or something. And it, it's, it's still to this day, it hurts. It's embarrassing. It's, you know, my, my brother had flown in Garrett from, uh, from LA for our grandfather's funeral and, and he had seen it too. And he's, uh, like I said, he owns a treatment center out there. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, it's embarrassing and it's sad and I've tried everything to help her and she's just not willing to get help and that's another part of it too is you really have to want it. If you're happy and you're enjoying that life, I don't know if there's any help for you. But if you're like me and you want out and you don't want that life and you're sick of waking up every day and scrounging for whatever you can to feel better and you know, I just didn't want that life and I knew that I could do better and I knew that I was smarter and better and all those things and not that People that are addicts aren't smarter or better. I mean, I just know that I could accomplish more. I could do more with myself than just be this junkie or whatever you want to call it. And I hate those terms, but that's how people relate to people like me. So I'm using them to relate to others. Um, so yeah, like I said, what my life looks like today, I, I'm a treatment technician at Hotel California by the Sea Cincinnati. Been there about a year. I continue to work on my counseling license and I, uh, I have a son and a girlfriend. Um, and I'm happy, um, and I continue to be happy. Um, and, and not that I don't have bad days, but, but now that I've gone through counseling and I've gotten the help that I've needed and I have support systems in AA and NA, I have things to fall back on. When things get rough or things get bad, like my grandfather just passed away a little bit ago, my whole world didn't fall apart like it had with my father um, because I have things in place to help me. I have people to talk to. I have uh, a counselor and things like that. Like, so if things are bad, I can explain how I'm feeling and get it off my chest and, and take suggestions. That's my other thing that I would really stress for anyone is just be open-minded. If you haven't tried it, try it. What's the worst that can happen? You know, you don't have to live that way. And uh, 
you know, we always kind of say this in the meetings and stuff, but, uh, you know, clearly our way doesn't work, right? Like my way led me down that path, right? Where I was using every day and stealing and all these horrible things. So, uh, you know, it's important to uh, take suggestions and, and be open-minded. It's, I was very stubborn for a long time. So that's, that's also part of it, not just the fear of getting help, but also the fear of, uh, the fear of getting help, but also just that stubbornness, not wanting to, uh, thinking I knew how to deal with it, you know. You can't. This is a cunning and baffling disease, and it takes over, and it, it, it will ruin your life, and it'll take everything from you, your friends, your family. Uh, many, many friends have died that, that I've known, and, uh, and I won't get into all that in the specifics, but it's just not good. And, and I'm, I'm here today. Who knows why? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know part of the reason uh, why I'm here today and not dead is because I, you know, did these things. I got counseling and got on the right medications and dealt with these things in my life. So again, I think the important thing is is to reach out, do anything you can to uh, to get help because this will kill you if you do not get help.